I guess I just didn't realize that if the rainbow is an entire circle, technically, I heard, and you only see half of it, there can't be a pot of gold at the end. Well, maybe the real pot of gold is the friends that you make along the way. On the way, <laughs> the way of what? It's a pot of gold. Oh, all right. Well, I mean, I guess sure. an adventure. I think that's what it's about. I think that's the lesson that we learn from Lucky Charms. All right. <laughs> well, hello and welcome to the Sights and Sirens Back to Basic podcast, uh, where my brother and ER physician, Chris, and me, Jason, uh, firefighter, paramedic, and RN, talk about complicated medical issues that don't have to be so complicated. We bring them, bring them back to basics and help you apply them in your job, in your life, in your religion. <laughs> what? <laughs> <You can't laughs> say that. So why don't you tell us about our sponsors? All right. Well, today's sponsor is American CME. Uh, American CME is a company that does uh, free and CAPSI accredited uh, CEUs for EMS. So actually, these lectures that we do, or these podcasts, excuse me, that we do um, next month. So all the podcasts that we do this month, next month will be uploaded to American CME for you to watch there, take a short quiz, and you can get CME credits for it. Awesome. So also, we have the capability of doing nursing credits as well. Uh, so if you are a nurse and listening to our podcast, then shoot us an email at training at sitesandsirens.com and we can get you some nursing credits also. Cool. Yeah. What are we talking about today? Today we are going to talk about um, disaster triage. Nice. Yes. So this is something that I've always kind of had a passion for disasters. <laughs> That sounds <laughs> really... So you're a medical no, maniac? No, <laughs> not, not like, not causing them. No, no, I've always had a passion for uh, mass casualty and disaster preparedness and things like that. Oh, I thought you said preparedness. It sounds a lot more... It sounds better, culture. yeah. Cool. Yeah. So um, I actually had the privilege of going down uh, to Aniston, Alabama and doing some mass casualty training down there, uh, which is really cool, super awesome. Um, so something that's kind of that I, I've had a big interest in. And one of the things that always comes up when it comes to disaster preparedness, uh, emergency response in mass casualties is triage, okay? And it's supposed to be super simple, and we'll go over it, but it's just so hard. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So I want to talk about uh, the nuances of triage when it comes to disaster medicine, mass casualty events. But I really want to kind of talk more and discuss like how hard it is and can be for us to transition to that type of triage because it's so different than the type of triage we do on a daily basis as EMS and emergency providers. Right, right. Um, so the first thing I want to do is I want to kind of define some terms, okay? And this is one thing that I don't think that we... I, we always like to define terms on this podcast. I think it helps with, you know, when we go back to basics and that sort of thing, is understanding what we're actually talking about. So much in medicine, different... Uh, terms are used to mean multiple things. Mm -hmm. And I think we do a really bad job sometimes of defining what we mean when we're talking about something. So we're going to try to try to not do that today. In so, my experience, you use the fanciest word that no one knows the meaning of. Okay. Then you just look smart. You can't be wrong. Self-edify <laughs> and yeah. confuse everybody else. And then in that way, you have power over them. Okay. Well, we'll talk about that later. But I really enjoy being in an education. And, you yeah, know. apparently. So, all right. So a couple of things we're going to talk about. So the definition of what is a mass casualty incident. So a mass casualty incident is any event that produces multiple casualties by definition. So when you have a car accident and three people are injured, that's technically by definition, a mass casualty incident. Now, when we say mass casualty incident, though, we're typically, I think, talking about how we define disaster. Uh, yeah. And I think in my experience mm -hmm. in the field, we we sort of define a mass casualty or a disaster as something not that necessarily has multiple victims, but something that overwhelms our our system that's in exactly. place, right? Our local system that's in place. And so, that's actually the definition of disaster. So a disaster is any event that overwhelms the capabilities of local emergency response systems and facilities. So that's like so when we talk about we talk about MCIs and mass casualty events and, and incidents. That's usually what we actually mean, mm -hmm. right? So, because technically a mass casualty incident can be anything where there's more than one or two people involved, which is not really what we mean typically in emergency care when we say MCI. When we say MCI, we're thinking about disaster. We're, we're thinking kinda... of like 9 11. But here's the thing is like, we think about 9 11, we think about Sandy Hook, we think about like these like major things that are, you know, once in a career, once in a lifetime, pretty, pretty rare instances. But 
the, the triage techniques that we talk about today really should be being applied in the smaller incidents too. And I think sometimes we chalk it up to, well, I'd only use this if there's a 9-11 in my town, you know what I mean, or something like that. But mm-hmm. no, realistically, you can use this on a, on a bus accident when you've only got one ambulance that responded because you're you're overtaxed. Now yeah. let's set up the same system. It, it does work on a small scale too, and that's what makes it a good system. Right, you know? exactly. So we're going to talk about start triage and jump start triage today. And if you're not familiar with those, we're going to break it down for you. Um, but these are set up to be able to be used in any incident. So again, any incident that overwhelms the capabilities of local emergency, uh, the, the local emergency response system or local facilities really should, anytime that kind of event occurs, we should be shifting our mindset a little bit as emergency providers to this more MCI disaster triage type system. But that's really, really hard to do. That is not what we're trained to do. It, it, on paper, it's very simple. Like we'll go over start triage and jump start triage and it's like, oh yeah, very straightforward, check the boxes. But when you put yourself in that kind of situation, changing your mentality to do the most good for the most amount of people versus trying to help everyone is just not something that we're we're good at doing. Yeah, you know, I, I've heard it said, you know, we, we go from mitigating risk to minimizing loss. Mm-hmm. And we are not, we don't have the personalities to just minimize loss and do it that way, right? We, we want to mitigate the risk. We want to like handle the problem and solve everything and everyone's good to go. And in these situations, it's just not realistic. And I think that's even tougher on a local scale, right? Because right. it isn't this huge, you know, nine eleven like Sandy Hook like tragedy. It's not this massive tragedy that, of course, of course, we can't do everything. It's something on a local scale where it's four or five patients, and now I'm making decisions. And it's it's just four or five patients. Like we should be able to handle it, but we can't because. You know, I'm in a rural department or, you know, I don't have that many ambulances available and now I have to shift this mentality and it's, it can be heartbreaking. You yeah, know? absolutely. And I think, and, and that's the thing is that we, <laughs> I think that if we stop and actually think about it, we are probably in our EMS facilities in, and, and this is a, this is a tragedy in and of itself and a, a whole different conversation, but in our hospitals, in our EMS agencies, in our fire departments, in our municipalities, we are probably only a couple patients away from being overwhelmed on every call. Right. Right. I mean, we just don't, unfortunately, have a lot of places don't have the resources or the personnel or even the support system from other communities to be able to maybe respond the way they would like to. Not only, I said, I want, I want to focus on is the triage component here as, as EMS and emergency personnel. How do we switch our focus and triage, which is a huge change than our day to day? Um, but also so many other things you got to think about, you know, not only, you know, personnel, transportation, you know, if, if from a hospital standpoint, if you if your ER is full on a daily basis and there's a mass casualty event, there's a, you know, Boston Marathon body, you got to clear patients out of there, right. be, able to, be able to get more in. So yeah, what's rescue. your plan for that? What's your plan for that? What's your plan for opening up OR rooms for people who need surgeries? What's your plan for getting more surgeons in? What's your, so there's and a this lot. This challenge in education, I think, is that you can't be prepared for every inevitability or every possibility, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, you, you can't do that. Like when I was a, a, a younger fireman and, and new to the game, like I would constantly be like, what's our protocol for this? Like, what do we do if this happens? What? And like, finally, I remember my captain was like, you can't, like, we don't have a policy for that. Like we don't have a policy, Jason, for like, if a plane hits the fire station, like you, you, you want like a, you want this list of what we're going to do in all these situations. What we do have that I came to realize is, you know, procedures and stand, standard operating procedures that mm-hmm. we can apply, you know, to, to more broad situations and then handle the nuances as we come, right? Like you guys didn't see that coming with the whole, we didn't have enough people to staff that. But like when it comes to triage, start triage, jump triage, that's why it's so simple. And that's mm-hmm. why it's so malleable is it's, this works in all kinds of situations. Here are considerations you need to consider too, like rescue and how big the incident is and transportation and logistics. Like we'll have to think of those things. But in terms of education and making a plan, we have to have it be broad enough that it can handle almost anything, but mm-hmm. specific mm-hmm. enough that you know it, it can handle these weird nuances and these these changes. So. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why like I said, and that's why start triage and, and for pediatrics, jump start triage uh, 
is a an answer to that from the triage standpoint. So start triage, like you had mentioned earlier, is a triaging system that is meant for disaster and mass casualty events. Um, it's very different than our normal triaging system, I think, in healthcare and in EMS. But it works on a small scale. You know, when we talk about like, you know, patients, you know, maybe there's only five or six patients, but that's enough to overwhelm our services. Or if you've got a, you know, 9-11, Boston Marathon, any of these kind of things, it's going to work for that as well. So I want to talk a little bit about what START Triage is. So START Triage stands for Simple Triage and Rapid Treatment, okay? So it is a simple way of triaging in, in, in some of these terrible events. And the reason I think we, we, the reason we put these kind of things into play is because, especially in a situation like that, I mean, when we think about a true mass casualty disaster situation where our services are overwhelmed, our resources are overwhelmed, that in and of itself is terrifying and stressful. I mean, these are, we need a simple way to fall back on to be able to go through triage. Otherwise, we will completely get lost in the incident. Right. And if you're um, changing my thinking, you know, I'm, I'm used to treating the patient, taking care of everybody, right? And you want to change my whole mentality on scene in this disaster, you better make it pretty simple for me. It should right. be three steps or less. <laughs> I mean, exactly, like, yeah. Don't make it a 15-step plan because we're not going to be able to keep track of that anyway, right? right? And that's why we keep it simple. Exactly. So, again, we have to realize that start triage is meant for triaging in these incidents um, so that we can do – the mentality is we want to do the most good – the sorry, the greatest good for the greatest number, okay? That means that there will be people who we – cannot and will not try even to save, which that's well, the hard part. But we can, and that's what's tough, right? Like, sure. I think, oh, let, 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 let's kind of put that in there good because point. we can. I can sit down with that person and with my skills probably stabilize them, but we won't because I need to be able to get to 10 people over here. Mm -hmm. And that's the toughest thing, right, is right. you will find yourself knowing that you have the ability to single that person out and treat them and, and handle them. The system can absolutely handle that one person. And this is where we, we do have to let some people go in order to do the greatest good for the greatest number. Exactly. And that's what's just so, it feels backwards and it feels wrong, but, you know, it's... And that's why we have to understand the mentality behind it, because I, I, I'll be honest, I can't imagine walking into a mass casualty. I mean, I've done simulations. I mean, you and I have done simulations together at some of our colleges where we tip a bus over and make a bunch of people injured. And, and we know it's simulated, though, right? So I can't imagine actually walking up to someone who... Who I, as a physician, I know I could save you if I had the time and resources, but I know that I don't, and I just have to say, hey, sorry. Like, right. you know what I mean? I mean, I can't imagine that, but it is what we have to do. Because if we don't do that, we run the risk of... Um, losing so much more. Right, losing, losing so, so many, many more patients more. that we could save. So again, the people who are going to, unfortunately, like I said, and this is such a change in mentality, we're used to finding this. We want to find the sickest person, the person with the greatest injury, and we want to save them. But in this instance, we're going to try to save as many people we can, which means that most of the people who don't have serious injuries and don't are going to be saved. And right. and it goes back to resources, right? So if we over triage, where we basically make everybody critical patients, everybody are everybody's immediate, everybody's delayed, nobody's minor, we're going to run out of resources, right? We will run out of resources, and we there will be people that we could have saved that we now are not going to be able to save because we ran out of resources. And then the, that's usually what happens. That, that's usually in a, in, a, in, a, in a mass casualty incident. If you look at, you know, Sandy Hook and, and uh, actually the Boston Marathon bombing was probably one of, we, we as, I say we, but like we as an EMS community, as, as a, we, we did a really good job. Like they were prepared for that, uh, which was awesome. And I can talk a little bit about that later. But, um, but in some of these other ones, like over triage becomes the main issue because that's right. how we're trained to do. We're trained well, to help. We want to it, help people. So it's we a help good everybody. thing. I mean, it means that we're empathetic, right? <laughs> like right, under yeah. triage is an issue. We might be this like apathetic, terrible civilization, <laughs> right. right? Like it, there's nothing. I there's mean, nothing the, wrong, quote unquote. Un, you know, essentially under triage would be like you, you like like I don't a, care about any of these guys. Get up and walk. Well, no, I mean not that you don't <laughs> care, but like but like. I don't. You don't really want to get to the end of an MCI incident and be like, "Man, we got a bunch of stuff." Look left how over. much we have left over. <laughs> and like all these people could we have had been all saved. this pain medication and right. <laughs> you got like five ambulances in a garage. And you're like, right. "Man, I guess we could have transported oh, more." Shoot. Like, yeah, I guess I, I mean, shouldn't have held these back just in case for right. a rainy day. You know. And obviously, they like said I, there's something that you can't do about either of those. You know, but on the most part, we're gonna make ish. We're gonna make errors on the sides of over triage, and yeah. we just have to be very careful. Which is why we use a system like Start. Right. 
So start triage. Um, let's start talking about it. Let's start talking about start triage. I like that. Okay. So what you want to start talking about? It. Like, was, what's it the, was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> what's the first step in start triage? So we're going to walk in there and we're going to basically say, can anybody walk or wave your, your hand at me? And if they can do that, we know a couple things about them. They can follow commands. They can understand me. They can hear me. And they probably can walk. So these are the minimal, in this situation, minimal injuries, the minimalistic situation, right? These are the guys that are ready to go, the walking wounded, yeah. we call them, right? And in that situation, we're going to take care of them first. It's literally, it's well, we're not going to say take care of them first. We're I mean, going to get gonna, them out of the way. So we're going to say, right. everyone get to me. And then usually we're going to load them up to an area and get them triage, not treated yet, but just get them to where they Another need to go, triage. right? We're, we're we're clearing out all the, the minor stuff first, right? So those, those, that's the thing. So we've got. We've, I should have probably said this first. So there's there's four categories, right? So patients either marked as minor, meaning that they're like some minor injuries, delayed, meaning that their treatment will be delayed, immediate, meaning that they need to be immediately treated, and then expectant, meaning that we're going to do nothing. They're going to die. They're either already dead or they're it is they're, untenable. Right. Right. We're not going to try. And we do that green, yellow, red. Black. Right, correct. So if you're more of like a green light, red light kind of guy, like me, that's easy to remember, right? right? So we handle the greens first. And when I say handle, I don't mean treat. I don't mean you treat, stabilize. You mean triage. You triage, I mean the triage the them first. first. Let's exactly. get them out of the way because likely there's more of them and we can kind of clear out a good number of the population then. And now there's mm-hmm. less people to triage, right? It, it is a backwards way of looking at it. We usually are like, hey, let's concentrate on the serious stuff first. Exactly. But you have to figure we're on a clock. And I, I try to kind of remember this as, we are losing all of these patients. You have to look at it that way. We are losing all of these patients. How fast are we are we losing them? I want to ha- I want to get the ones that are are I'm losing the slowest first. They're all they're all important, right? I want to get the ones I'm losing the slowest first, so that I can then pinpoint the the serious ones and get to right. them and 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 stop them from dying. And right? the and because again in this triage system we're trying to do the greatest good for the greatest number. So there's right. you know statistically there's going to be more people who are minorly injured than majorly injured. So we right. wanted so again so the first question is can they walk, right? If they can walk, they are minor. They're green tagged essentially. We usually use a tagging system. They're green tagged, they're minor. And a lot of times it's, it's literally like, it's literally like being like, "Hey, can you guys walk?" Okay, get out of the way. You know, you send, right, yeah. and you send them to like a walk secondary, <laughs> right? You send them to a secondary triage area yeah. where they can be triaged separately. One little red flag like thing that we need to watch with that is that you can get you can get hemmed up in at this point right now and it can ruin your entire MCI. And one thing that we've learned from a lot of scenarios is keeping track of those patients is difficult. If you can walk, if you were at the Boston Marathon and I say, can you walk? And I'm like, great, yeah, walk over there. You might go seek treatment on your own. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, is that is going to take a bed away from someone who needs treatment. So we do need to try to keep track of these people because they're at risk for jumping in their car, driving away and going into those hospitals on their own. And those hospitals are becoming overtaxed. So we do need to kind of and we've corral them together and hold them back mm-hmm. if anything. And, and explain that to them. Wait, wait a minute. We're going to get to you. I promise you we're going to get to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's, there's people that need this now, right? So... I think sometimes, like I've seen students come into these scenarios and they walk in and they're like, anyone walk? Cool, like walk over there. And then I've had, I've told like the the mock people to be like, just walk, try to walk away from the incident and stuff. See if these guys are paying attention because this is something that can that can very much drastically, if you're a logistics officer or you're a transport officer and you're trying to figure out, I've got seven beds over here and I, at, at, you know, St. Joe's and I've got seven beds over at, at St. Pete's, you know, Five of those beds can be taken up by walking wounded if mm-hmm. I'm not keeping track of them and keeping them at the incident, or at least. And it's also why, yeah, it's also them. why, like, so from a hospital standpoint, we so there's like the there's the triage on the scene, right? Like we're gonna triage these people on the scene, and then there's gonna be a treatment area on the scene as well, right? So we have to kind of redo that again when you get to the hospital, right? So mm-hmm. like, if, so if we know, like, so for instance, in the Boston Marathon bombing. The first hospital, and I don't remember exactly which hospital it was, but it may have been Mass General. But um, when they they found out about the incident by like one of their employees like tweeted it, and mm-hmm. that's how they found it. So they immediately set up their own triage. A, a, a physician and a resident went out and basically started a new triage. So as because in the first two hours, most 
like a lot of people showed up by private vehicle to be, mm-hmm. yeah. and, and you have to basically the hospital too has to be like, no, we know that we're going to expect ambulances you to come need to with go like farther away, than red tech. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So, well, but that's the but thing yeah. is a lot of times. So, like what we set up sometimes with, with like local government fire departments and stuff like that is sometimes we try to set up for those green people. It's not that we're like concentrating on them or like putting too much resources into it, but sometimes we'll be like, cool, stay here. A bus is on its way, and it's going to take you 50 miles north of here to the farthest away hospital that I can think of that's not going to be taxed. And that way those guys know, hey, I'm going to be treated, and I'm going to be treated far away so that we can take the critical incident people or the critical people to the closer hospitals. You know what I mean? So there's nothing wrong with with kind of like buttoning that up right away. And that is more of an officer or like a leadership position, but it is a tactic that we might want to consider. What you might want to concentrate on as just a boots on the ground provider is keeping track of those greens and explaining to them, you know, those lower priority patients, hey, don't go by private vehicle to the hospital. Like, or if you're going to, we have a hospital designated for you, and it's a little bit farther away because we got to handle the, the serious. And that's people. actually that's what we did really well. I say, I say we. I, I, did, I had nothing to do with the you know Boston Marathon bombing, but I, when I say we, I mean as EMS providers, as EMS and emergency providers, we did a really good job with the Boston Marathon bombing. So the the on the scene team did a really excellent job of dispersing patients to all the hospitals in the area so that no one ever got overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. When we didn't do a good job of it was Oklahoma City bombing. So in the Oklahoma City bombing, 202 patients were treated at one hospital with six other hospitals nearby did not receiving any patients oh, at all. Oh, geez, yeah. Right. So again, now, now you've run into, you're talking about a disaster and, and overwhelming resources. It happened at the scene and then it happened at the hospital. And, and there was, so again, that's that's where we, that's why the start triage is so important. So, yeah. and this can be for a lot of reasons, though. Let's just remember that it wasn't like the provider's faults or anything oh, like no, that. Like yeah, it, yeah. it could be, some of it could have been over triage. Some of it could have been people just jumping in their cars and taking a private vehicle and getting out of there. You know, some of it could have been miscommunication on the hospital's parts. You know, there's, there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah. Absolutely, no. And that is that those are the things that we kind of have to take into consideration. So from start triage, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, can you walk? If you walk, your tag is minor or green. Mm-hmm. All right. The second question we're going to ask, we're going to look at their breathing. Okay. So, so now we're going to go a patient at a time. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, that, yeah, that is yeah. the thing. So now like it's just the closest one to you, you're going to go to, you're going to tag, you're going to move on. Right. And this is a team that is just designed there to tag. They're not going to do much treatment at all. They're not. They're assessing very minimally, you know what I mean? They're, yeah. they're not taking people out right now. No. Typically, we'll have a crew go in, tag, 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 and then later a crew will come in and actually take them to the treatment area. And that's a good point. So we should probably bring that up now too. So there's, you really have to, in these kind of incidents, stick with what you're tasked to do. So there should be a triaging team, which your job is only to triage. You're not doing anything else. You're not rescuing anyone. You're not treating anyone. You're not doing anything but quickly and efficiently triaging everybody as fast as you can. You're not even calling resources, right? No, hey, this right. person's trapped. Hey, someone, like, let me nope. let the rescue team. It's just, it's just not your job right now. Right. You have to compartmentalize. Right. And it's tough. So you're triaging so that then the rescue team can come in and they can see where the red tags are and they're going to start. So you're starting with green, yellow, red. You know, they're starting with the immediates, right? Yeah. They're going to ignore the black tags. They're going to go right for the immediates. They're going to rescue the immediates. Once they've rescued all the immediates, they're going to come back in and rescue all the delayed. And obviously, they like said, the minors have been, like, hopefully walked to a different yeah. secondary triage area. So, again, if, if you start, if you're, if you're tasked with triage and you start rescuer treatment, then there's a bunch of people not getting triaged and they're not getting triaged fast enough, which means the rescue team can't rescue them and they're going to die. Right. And that's, again, so we have to stick with our task. So there's the triage team. We're going to triage and tag everybody. The rescue team comes in, rescues the reds first, then the yellows, and then there's the treatment team. So you're going to set up treatment areas. So the tr- usually two treatment areas. So one is that secondary treatment area that you sent all the greens to, all the mm-hmm. miners to. They could do secondary triage there. And then the treatment area that probably has more of the advanced resources to start treating the reds and then the yells, the immediates, and right. then the delayeds. Um, and then from there, you know, they'll get transported out. So, again, right. sticking with your role within these kind of incidents is so important because, as you can see, if you breach, if you go away from that, like you said, you're going you're gonna to run into issues. So where we're at is I come in, I wave people down. Hey, you can walk. Come on to me. They get out of there. And then now I'm going person by person, the closest person starting mm-hmm. that. That's the easiest way to do it. Start with the closest person to you and just start tagging. Right. So, so the way you do this is, so the thing, first thing you look at is breathing, right? And it's always the first thing we look at, ABCs kind of thing. So are they breathing? If they're not breathing, 
you can attempt to position their airway. Just okay? position. Just position. I'm not talking about you're not bagging them, you're not putting oxygen on them, you're just positioning. So you're doing a jaw thrust or you're tilting their head. If they start breathing, they're red. If they start breathing on their own, mm-hmm. with just the position. With just right? the position. So I'm just, you tag all them. I'm doing is opening their airway. And if they start breathing on their own, cool, here's you a red. tag them immediate and you walk away. You don't do anything else. That's it. Right. right. So none of the, this is not like then you move on to pulse. No, 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 right. no. Like you're done. That that t- that a person is obviously in critical condition. They are alive. There might be something we can do for them. They're immediate. They're red. You move on. And I mean, this goes against right. You know your 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 CPR training that you learned when you were a babysitter before you started EMT school, mm-hmm. right? So this is this is tough for us because we want to go in. Oh, I'm going to check breathing and pulse at the same mm-hmm. time. You're not worrying about it. Just right. open the airway. If they breathe on their own, tag them red. Move on. Right. If you position the airway and nothing happens then they're expectant, you black tag them, and you move on as well. And remember, that this is so it happens very quickly, right? You're, you're like rushing through, hey, I hit this guy, hit this guy, hit... It's not like we're like moseying from one guy, and we're like, oh, he's probably not going to make it. Right, on yeah. to the next one. You know what I mean? Like this, the reason why it's so simple, too, is that we can do it very quickly then, so that then you can... Jo- if you were the initial tag team, you're most likely going to be assigned to rescue or transporting them to those areas sooner anyway, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. you'll, you'll get to them faster if you can triage them faster. Exactly, exactly. So if they are spontaneously breathing... On their own, okay. You didn't you didn't have to position their airway, but they are spontaneously breathing. The next thing you're gonna look at is their respiratory rate, okay. And the only number to remember here is 30. So the start triages for adults, jump start triages for pediatrics, which we'll talk about next. But start triages for adults. So if they are spontaneously breathing on their own, you didn't have to do anything. You're gonna look at their respiratory rate. If it's greater than 30, they're immediate, which is red pretty tag. fast, right? Right. I mean, greater than 30 is fast. 12 to 20 is normal. Mm-hmm. So 30 is fast. Right. If they're if they're 22, then you can move on to the next step. If they're 29, you if they're 30, if they're th- if they're greater than 30 though, they get a red tag, immediate patient, and you move on again. All right. If the respiratory rate is less than 30, then we can move on to perfusion. Right. So we're still kind of doing an ABC thing here. We're just stopping if we run into anything. The next thing is perfusion. So there's two things we're looking for in perfusion. We're looking at their radial pulse, and we're looking at their capillary refill. That's it. We're not getting blood pressure. We're not listening to their heart. We're not checking like multiple pulses. You know what I mean? Like you're not checking a carotid. We're checking a radial. And that's actually kind of something that like is a little bit nuanced here a little bit too. Like we're checking a radial pulse because if they have a radial pulse, it means they're getting distal perfusion. Right. Which means that they're Tip- more viable, right? Right. To typically in first. CP, yeah. Typically in CPR and stuff, we check a carotid pulse because that's the one that like closest to the core. It's the last bastion, right? Oh, right. So now yeah. we're checking the first one to see, hey, is blood shunting to the core? I'll lose my radial pulse first, then my mm-hmm. brachial, then my carotid. So we want to see if it's best case scenario. Hey, do they have a radial? Right. If they do not have a radial pulse, obviously they're going to be immediate. All right. They're going to be red tagged immediate. And that doesn't mean that they don't have a pulse, remember? So they could have a they could have a carotid pulse. We're not checking it. Right. But they don't have a radial. Right. So that tells us And they're breathing. It's serious. They're they're decompensating. Right. They're decompensating, but that's why they get immediate. Right. Right. If they're or if their cap refills less than two seconds, right? So if they don't have a radial pulse or their cap refills less than two seconds, that's a sign of inadequate perfusion. We're gonna immediate tag them with red. If they do have a radial pulse and their capillary refill is greater than two seconds. Or sorry, less than two seconds. Capillary refill, we're talking about squeezing the finger and seeing how long it takes for color to, right. to flush back. Just exactly. to take it back to basics for those of you who might not remember. Exactly. Then we're going to look at their mental status. All right? And the only thing we're going to do is can they obey commands? So if you're like, hey, squeeze my hand. If they can do that, then they're delayed. They're yellow. If they can't do that, then they're red. Yeah. Okay? That's it. That's and the like, whole be, thing. be fair with the command. If they don't have a hand, don't be like, show me two fingers on your hand. Oh, you can't follow the command. Immediate. You're done. That's over triage, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. So again, so it's very, very simple, but you can see how if you, if you put yourself in those kind of shoes in this kind of, like, also so different than what we would typically yeah. do in any other situation, right? right? So quick review. You do the quick review. Yeah, so a couple things. When we talk about tagging a patient, we are using probably pre-made tags, like little necklaces that we can put around the neck of the patient. And then we usually rip off the colors that they're not, and it leaves them with the color that they are. Mm -hmm. A lot of times there's like a double color thing that we can pull so that I can eventually come back with all my tags, like all my receipts basically from these patients, and hand that to a triage officer who can then say, oh, okay, I've got... I've got seven greens that are walking over here. I've got four reds and I've got two yellows, right? So they can keep track and then they can have a little bit of uh, uh, 
quality they assurance there, right? <laughs> right yeah. to, to know that they've got everybody where they need to, and, and they can keep and they track, can plan right? too. Like if you show up to Health the treatment, yeah, if you go, show up to the treatment area, and I see that you've got twenty red tags. And I, I got to see how I'm going to allocate my resources and that sort of thing. Yeah, so, so this yeah. can be done with these fancy tags that have like this little receipt thing you pull off of them, or it can be done simply with like we have like ribbon paper that we take with us, but we like we'll just tie a little piece of ribbon paper around your wrist and then move on from there. But always make sure that you rip off a little bit of that, put it in your pocket so that you can show that triage officer eventually, hey, I have this many reds, this many yellows, this many greens, this many blacks, right? So you can kind of, mm. again, get that those logistics going early. So I walk in, I, I say, hey, can anyone walk? If they can walk, they're coming to me, they're tagged as green, and they're, go- they're going to go on their own over to the treatment area, probably a separately placed mm-hmm. treatment area from the reds and yellows. Next, I'm going to go to the first person I bump into. When I bump into them, I'm going to first check, are they breathing? If they're not breathing, I'm going to try to open their airway up. If they breathe after that, I tag them red, I move on. Right? Yep. Means that they're means that they're able to compensate after some positioning, right? But it's serious because they don't breathe on their own unless there's positioning. If they are breathing when I first get to them, then I'm going to say, okay, are they breathing higher than 30 or less than 30 times a minute? If it's higher than 30 times a minute, that's fast. It means they're they're probably going to be crashing here soon. Here's a red tag. I move on. If they are less than 30, now I can move on to a pulse, right? So if they're 29 or less, I can check for a pulse. I check for a radial pulse, not the last bastion, the first bastion to see if they've got peripheral perfusion, right? And if I don't feel a pulse, they get tagged red. If I do feel a pulse, I check mental status. Mm-hmm. And cap refill with a part of that as well. Yes, yeah. cap refill too. Um, so we want not only a pulse, but also cap refill of less than two seconds. It just means they have good distal perfusion, like mm-hmm. you were saying. Now I want to check mental status. Hey, show me two fingers, or how many quarters are in a dollar, or can you squeeze my hand? Really following commands following is the best commands way, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so, hey, squeeze my hand, something like that. Something that they can do. Wiggle your toes. If they can do that. They get a yellow because they can follow commands. Mm-hmm. They can't do that. They get a red. Right. Exactly. And that's it. So again, a simple triage and rapid treatment, you know, protocol basically here, triage system for disasters and MCI. Again, very simple, very straightforward, but obviously difficult in the sense that you have to be able to make that decision um, to triage in that way. Mm-hmm. And I actually, you know, as I'm speaking on it now, like I wonder, like what's harder is to follow start triage when you've been told to start follow triage or be the guy who shows up in an event and says you know what we're gonna have to follow start triage here yeah. right like to make that Making call the decision yeah yeah especially again when local refor- resources are you know if you're if even where we are right now if you're 30 miles north of there you're, you're talking rural farmland right who are overwhelmed by things that my department would be able to handle because we have multiple rigs that are constantly in the city they've mm-hmm. got paid on call guys that are coming you know from far away they might only have one ambulance so something that that's where it's gonna be the toughest right mm-hmm. something that can normally be handled in an intercity department versus we can't handle it out here i've got to decide to switch to this life or limb situation right right you know it's it's tough, yeah, right? Exactly. Making that's that call, a hard decision I can't to do. It, that would be, but it, it's important, and it does save life. That is the most important decision most right. of the time. That that affects the most amount of lives and saves the most amount of lives. We didn't talk about black tags yet, so I would like you to just kind of mention what a black tag is. So black tag is that the the, the expectant essentially. Right. So that means that they are dead. So if I show up and they are not breathing, and I open their airway and they're still not breathing, then they get black. They get black tag, right? So if they if they don't meet the criteria for red tag, they get black tag. And the big thing here that goes against what we normally do is like this person we're not going to check, but this person could have a pulse. Yes, right. This person could have a crowded pulse, and normally we'd be like, okay, we got to start CPR. Well, we'll know they're alive right now, and we cannot afford because it needs to go to other people. We cannot afford to sink resuscitated efforts into them. Right. So they are not going to make it past yeah. this incident. And that's, that's why tough. we don't even check, right? We don't even check because right. we just, there's nothing we could do. Even if, you know, so we don't even check. We If they're breathing, if they're not breathing, excuse me, and we position their airway and they're still not breathing, we don't even check a pulse, they're expectant, we give them a black tag. Right. right. It's just tough to hear. And for some of our listeners who maybe aren't like deep into the medical field, like this might be really surprising to you, but you do need to understand like if Chris was down and I I came in, I'm the triage guy and I come in and he's not breathing, I reposition his airway. He doesn't start breathing, so I can't tag him red, so I tag him black. If instead I was like, you know what? No, I really, I need to check him and I checked for a pulse. He doesn't have a pulse. I start doing CPR. How long am I going to do CPR for? What resources am I going to spend? And then all of these other patients aren't getting tagged right. and all of these other patients are getting more and more critical and the 
time is ticking and these people are dying now mm -hmm. because I got caught up and got tunnel vision on one person. It's it's a tough decision to make. It's a tough situation to be in, mm -hmm. but you have to be able to do it. It's what you're called to do out right, there. Right, right. And the other thing too is, is keep in mind that none of this has anything to do with like signs of trauma or injury. Right. Like if you have a, a you know piece of pipe coming out of your abdomen, but you're breathing and your respiratory rate is less than 30 and you have a pulse and you're following commands, you're yellow. You're yellow. Yeah. People are getting treated before you, which, right. so that, that does then bring us to the whole idea of re-triage, right? So obviously we are going to have to re-triage people as they move, as we respond and that sort of thing. So someone who was red, who now is no longer breathing by the time I get to them and I position their airway and they're still not breathing they're not black, right? right? Like we're not, we're not just because they were red before. Now they're black yeah. or someone who was yellow, but had a pipe in them. And now they're decompensating. They don't have a radial pulse anymore. Okay. Well now they're red. They're not yellow. So we have to, there is some retriage that has to happen. But At the triage station, usually right after rescue comes in and pulls them there. Now we're going to retriage in the same way that in the field, we reassess constantly to mm -hmm. see how someone's doing, right? It's the same thing, right? You're really just reassessing the patient. And if they don't meet the criteria, we can't spend the resources on them because right. we have limited resources. So the rescue team may do some, short reassessment for people who are now expectant but they shouldn't necessarily like, i agree with kind of what you're saying like the rescue team really should come in see the tag move the red patients first and then at the treatment area we can kind of re just like i said that at the hospital too it's kind of like that treatment area. we're going to reassess and re-triage based on how things have evolved because things are going right. to change right so and, and you know what it's not necessarily a, this sinking feeling if i if i showed up at an incident as a yellow right and they took me to the triage area and then you're sitting there and you say okay i'm going to check a couple things and then you go i want you to scoot down to the red <laughs> right. that doesn't nece that shouldn't necessarily terrify me what that should tell me is hey I just went up and I might I might be more serious, but I just went up in priority. They're going to give me some treatment faster over right, there, right? right? So it it's appropriate. It's not like we're like you're a lost cause, head on down the line. Like that's not what we're doing. No, we're right. getting people who need the serious treatment first, the first treatment. Well, and again, it's only and, and the only patients who are who we're doing nothing for are the expectant patients, yeah. right? So the other patients, we're, it's it's a matter of who we're doing stuff for first, right? right? So we're going to do stuff for the red patients, the immediate patients first, before the delayed yellow patients, before the minor patients, yeah. in terms of resources. It's it's not like you show up to the treatment area and they're like, oh, you don't look so good. Things are changing. Here's a black tag. Go sit over there. <laughs> yeah. Like you're awake. I mean, like yeah. this is the only people who are not breathing. And if, if we hear someone like from the from the black area be like, hello, you know, they're not going to stay in the black area. Right. You're like, you were already tagged black. <laughs> Sorry. You can't. Yeah. We're going to yeah. upgrade them too. Yeah, so. you, can't, you can't get upgraded once you're black. So, if you're, so uh, what's the big difference between jump start and start triage? It's my understanding that we just jump. In children, we're going to do the same thing. So the first thing, again, we're going to say, can you walk? If, they, if the children can walk, they're going to go over to a secondary triage area. Now, if they're not at walking age, <laughs> um, this, this becomes a little bit difficulty. So if they're not in walking age, we're just going to assess infants first, which just kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. Of course we are. We're going mm -hmm. to assess infants first. So just keep that in mind. But if, they, if, they're, if they're not walking, just like with adults, we're going to assess breathing first. If they are not breathing, we're going to position the airway, just like we did in adults. If they start breathing with that, then they're marked as immediate. They're given red. a red tag, mm -hmm. and we move on. If they're not breathing after we position the airway, we're actually not done. This is the difference in jump to start. We're allowed to palpate a pulse now, okay? And remember, we said in adults, we're not going to palpate a pulse because we're not going to do CPR on these, on these adult patients yeah. at all. It doesn't matter. And in kids, we're not going to either. If they don't have a pulse... We mark them as expectant or deceased, and we and we black tag it and move on. Mm -hmm. If they do have a pulse, we position the airway. They're still not breathing, but they do have a pulse. We can give five rescue breaths. Just breathing, no compressions, breathing. No nothing compressions, like that. Right. Just breathing, because they're going to respond to that. That might start their heart. You know, well, no, no, we're, I'm we're not, not saying start their heart back up, but it might start their heart going in the right direction just from the breath. The oxygenation right. might kick their heart rate back up and might so that they cause them to start spontaneously, spontaneously breathing. Correct. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So if we give five rescue breaths and they start spontaneously breathing, then we mark them as red immediate and we move on. If they, if after five rescue breaths, they don't start spontaneously breathing, we mark them as expectant or deceased. Yeah. Now, so this big, is hard because yeah. we did check a pulse. So we know this kid has a pulse. We give Sometimes, five rescue yeah. breaths. 
and still no good still no good yeah. and then we have to leave that kid and that yeah. that i think might be one of like probably the hardest part of of start triage because yeah. in the adults you're not even checking for a pulse right in a kid you're checking for a pulse if they don't have one well then they're dead and yeah you you're acutely as... aware that with more resources oh man yeah if you could do cpr on this kid he might survive but you're not going to so yeah. that's that's uh that's hard so that's the biggest difference with Jumpstart is that we're allowing for these extra airway interventions, these mm-hmm. five rescue breaths, essentially, yeah. right? And for allowing to check for a pulse. Now, obviously, if they are breathing, we're going to go on a respiratory rate. In kids, it's going to be if it's less than 15 or greater than 45 breaths per minute, then they're going to be marked red or immediate. So for, we, we change our 30 number. Now right. it's 45 on the high side, 15 on the low side. Exactly. And then if they are breathing within that range, which is normal, 15 to 45, we're going to check a pulse a radial pulse and cap refill, right? If they don't have a radial par- pulse, excuse me, or their cap refill is less, uh, greater than two seconds, they're going to be red or immediate, just like in adults. And then we're going to check if they do have those things, we're going to check mentation, which in kids, we're going to use the AVPU, right? Are they alert? alert? verbal, painful, or unresponsive. Exactly. Are right? they alert? Do they respond to verbal stimuli, painful stimuli, or are they unresponsive? So if they, uh, if they are any of those except unresponsive, they get marked as delayed. Okay. Or yellow. And that's basically... So that's the big difference is jumpstart is that we're going to... Basically, that, that airway intervention piece. We're allowed yeah. to give those five rescues. Sounds breaths, like so. the big difference is, yeah, are, are if they're not breathing, I position their airway. They're not breathing on their own. Normally, I tag them red as an adult, but now I'm going to jump in. I'm going to do five breaths and then continue to assess. Right. And then if they, if they are breathing... Now I'm just changing my rate definition, right? It's not the 30. It's not greater or less than 30. It's going to be greater than 45 and less than 15. Exactly, exactly. So so hopefully this was a good review of kind of start and jumpstart triage. Um, if you guys just even said, if this sounds like kind of confusing, if you just Google start triage or jumpstart triage, you can see this kind of written out in a nice algorithm. Uh, very straightforward and simple, but obviously some nuances, right? Very difficult to make this decision, um, but it is something that we have to be prepared to do as emergency providers. It's going to save a lot of lives. Absolutely. So again, today's sponsor is American CME. This lecture next month, uh, this podcast next month will be available on their website for uh, CME credits. Um, the lectures that podcast we did last week, or and I guess last month, are on there uh, hopefully soon. So check that out to get some continuing education credits if you're an EMS. Thank you guys for listening, and we will see you next time. Stay sweet. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed the episode. If you're an EMT or medic student or an advanced EMT student or an instructor of those students, we have a program just for you. With Sights and Sirens NREMT prep program, you get video lectures over 15 hours of really vetted, great content to help you through your program and help you prepare for the test. Check it out at www.sightsandsirens.com.